But for example, I want to know what is the relevance of your topic to other paramedics. And that relevance in some cases could be this has relevance because it's just good information for continuing education. It could be relevant in the sense that this could change practice. It could be relevant in saying this might alter the, the protocols under which we work, right? It's whatever the case is, but I want you to actually be thinking about the relevance that this particular information has towards, uh, towards the industry in some fashion, whatever that happens to be, right? Um, so I'll give you a kind of a series of questions that I'll want you to be able to answer um, when information is presented to you. Uh, you need to keep track of your literature review, of the articles that you have. You need to physically have those articles. Either have them printed out and keep a file of, of your original articles that you're looking into, or, uh, or you'll need to keep them, you can keep them electronically too, that's fine. Pull them into a, just a, a zip drive or a zip drive, to a flash drive of some sort. Or a file someplace so that you have all of that original information. Uh, and certainly I need to be able to find that. So when we, when, when research papers are graded and they're evaluated, uh, one of the things that's evaluated on is also looking up the, that original research and making sure that it's legitimate research. Right? So I need to be able to find those articles. Uh, and then there might be times where if I'm reading it and I'm looking at this going, boy, they're, they're saying that somebody said this and based on what I know about the, the place that they're, they came from, that doesn't make sense. And so I'll want to be able to go back to that, read that original article and say, ah, they interpreted this incorrectly. Or, yeah, they interpreted that right. They're just weird, off the rockers. I don't know, whatever. So whatever the case is, um, I need to be able to, to follow that trail. So as you're starting to gather your information, make sure you keep it, uh, either electronically or hard copy. Either way, it doesn't really matter, but make sure you keep it. Good. When I write papers, I have a big giant file of all the, the papers that I'm going back to. And um, usually I have a lot of highlight, highlight work in it, and usually little stickies on the side that point me to certain passages that I need to make sure that I keep readily available that I can go back to. Um, so just kind of think about that as you're gathering up all the information that you're using. And you've got lots and lots of time, right? You've got a term and a half that you're going to be working on this project. So you'll have lots of time to kind of perfect it, make the wording correct, watch your grammar, look up things to make sure you know how to word things correctly, get rid of your run-on sentences, use punctuation properly, cite correctly. Um, we already put up a, a thing about citing, how to, how to cite properly, but um, I'll put up a couple more examples of just paper so you can see, uh, again, how it's done. So, make sense? And while you're at it, if you find a particularly powerful or interesting article or paper or something that really spoke to you, feel free to share it. Share it with me, share it with others. Um, I can post it on Moodle for everyone if, they are, if they're interested in reading that particular article as well. Um, so whatever the case is, um, that's perfectly fine. Sound good? Questions on that? Excellent. Uh, remember that today uh, I need to see your workout logs. Um, either I need to see them electronically or in paper, however you have them. And you should have a one-ish to two-ish page document for me that is related to your workouts and the meaning of them behind your health in EMS. Uh, so I'll need that today as well. Good, and we have a few minutes, and I wanted to revisit something that we did last term for a second uh, that we didn't have a chance to ever discuss. Dr. Death. No. Whoa. Oh that was a while ago. <laughs> yeah, last term. Plot twist. So, uh, Spot twist. Go figure. Other than just the the general shock value of Doctor Death, 
what, what kinds of things did it make you think of? And what kinds of things, um, maybe you haven't thought of them since that time, but what kinds of things do you think that, that type of a situation should make us think of? When I was listening to it, like the first episode, I think they were talking about how he's in the operating room, and all these people in the operating room are watching him do something that they know is wrong. And nobody in the operating room says anything about it, or stops him, or really does anything. And the, they didn't really address that, I thought, in the episodes or in real life. But in my head, I was thinking, like, those people are just as culpable in some ways as him for, like, they, like, literally one of the nurses says, like, I knew he was, like, injuring this person's spine. And so, and it just, like, continued on, you know? And I, so I was, like, thinking about how part of the problem is, like, what we were just talking about with someone having more authority over someone else, and so they wouldn't be, you know, comfortable to say something about that. Um, but also just, like, it's, I think it's everybody's responsibility if you see, like, an improper treatment or something being performed that you have to stop it. And not just, like, retroactively say, like, yeah, he wasn't doing the right thing, but, like, they should have physically stopped what he was doing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and with that, like, how easy was it for him to be dis be, be dis uh, cut off at one place and just go somewhere else? And there's no oversight of that specific, no better business bureau of physicians, essentially. But is it weird? With, like, aren't they all, because they talked yeah, about some that. book or website or something that was like, if you're put on this list, you, there was, but they plan. didn't want to put him on yeah. that list because then, in high, in retrospective, they would be liable for everything he did. Yeah. And then he, yeah, the he could sue them. Yeah, right. oh, that was it, because oh. of the missed wages that he could have earned. The influence of money. I found it interesting that I didn't feel, well, I started looking at the hierarchy, like, as a doctor, you're, you're at the high end of the food chain. And as a paramedic, you're at the lower end of the food chain. And when you mess up, like, you don't have as much uh, of a cushion or safety function around you looking out for you. Uh, but then again, I thought of some paramedics I knew or some EMTs I knew that were shitty EMTs that just went to another state that had fewer, fewer standards <coughs> and went and got their EMT and their joke was, do you know the difference between uh, an A paramedic and a D paramedic? They're both paramedics. And uh, the difference between a paramedic that makes an A in class and a paramedic that makes a D in class. What's the difference? There isn't, they're both paramedics. It's the same that, that was their joke, and uh, just watching how people can, when they want to, skirt around uh, accountability. I found it interesting. I was interested how exceedingly frustrated they were getting the people who, who actively wanted to do something, and how they were being stonewalled and diverted. And they, they couldn't make something stick to this guy despite having all the evidence um, because everybody was rushing in to protect him, not really for the sake of the doctor, but for the sake of their institution and their own reputation. Yeah. And it immediately just jumped out at they did not have public safety and health in mind at all. Thoughts, concerns? It was a little bit personal for me because my brother had that spine surgery. He had 14 inches of his spine fused. And I don't think there was any malpractice per se in that. But one thing that did happen was when he was on the operating table, we were practicing new uh, blood level techniques, trying to keep the hematocrit levels or the, the uh, certain blood supply levels at a certain range. I can't remember what it was, but it's the hematocrit levels got so low that they starved his pocket nerve of oxygen. 
while he was on the operating table and then flying on the operating table. So not only did he get paralyzed from the waist down or from the nipples down, but he went into surgery able to see and came out of surgery unable to see because of the practice that they were doing at that time. And when he was brought out of his chemically induced coma four days after surgery, and they realized that he was blind, the hospital did whatever they could to get him out of that hospital as fast as they could. So he was supposed to be there for three months. Two weeks later, he was transferred to Portland. So they wanted him out of there. So, yeah. so it was a little bit of a, I don't think it was purposely done by any stretch. It was a new technique that they were trying to do. It obviously it didn't go well. Um, so it wasn't a purposeful intent to harm the patient. Is all his person? Yeah, is all his personality? It's like how far does his personality get him? Yeah. Uh, in reality, because it wasn't about the skills; that it was reviews were right. about. It was all about how he treated people. Mm -hmm. He was a good salesman. About his required required educational times and surgeries, and he didn't have any of that experience. He had like not even a fraction of what he was supposed to mm -hmm. have, just for the bare minimum to graduate. And yeah. Yet they still passed him. and recognize that you are not going to be the best person for the job. Um, and I think that's really applicable to these intubations. And you can see it in our protocol. Like when are you going to take a step back and be like, it's going to be that more beneficial to be a less aggressive medic because I know my skill versus when, when should you get your seemingly innocuous practice in that could really damage somebody, you know? That's that's pretty terrifying. It is. I'm done speaking now. <laughs> End of sentence. I have a question, terrifying for you. Just as as a you're thinking of it from your standpoint as being terrifying to think consider that? Yeah. I mean I when I was listening to the podcast, you know, Human institutions are inherently flawed, but you know it's its own little revolution. If you can correct it on for yourself, like that's the one thing that I have a lot of control over is me. And so when I was listening to that podcast, I was listening to it from the perspective of what should he have done to stop himself, and what should I do to stop myself from becoming like. <laughs> but you know what I mean, like that's. And that's really scary. And Brooke had a really great quote on the board that was like, if a kid falls down five times, you know, they don't just say, walking isn't for me. And I thought about that, and it's this total balance of like, at what point do you decide, walking isn't for you? <laughs> like, walking isn't for you, versus, you know, you've fallen 5,000 times in scenarios, you've never gotten into trauma assessment, right? Like, when are you? When are you going to let it click, and when are you going to not let it click? Because clearly, you can't depend on an institution for failing you when you need to be failed. You know. And 
and certainly recognizing that if you're gonna fall five times, right? Whether or not you're still falling to practice or whether or not you're falling carrying the family's only eggs yeah. for their meal for the next yeah. week. Yeah. Right? So so there's a, a way to fall over and over and over again and get the practice you need until you stop falling. And then there's a way where falling actually means something to somebody else. Mm -hmm. And it's not just your learning any longer. Yeah. And just think think of the scary I mean you, you talked about the scariness of it, but Right? Think about those patients, right? Uh, I actually haven't looked at the Riverbend roster recently, um, but at least the last time I did, which was a year or two ago, Dr. Cho was still on the list, an anesthesiologist there. Didn't I talk to you guys about, about Dr. Cho, mm -hmm. right? I think I pushed a lot of Emmy over. He's still there? Did you work with him? I think he was an anesthesiologist. Did you work with him? Yeah, I think so. Okay, fantastic. So, oh my but I didn't, so in my, uh, did I didn't recognize that, that was him. I yeah. Know, I did. Until you literally just said, I was like, oh, yes. Yeah, so, I, yeah. that. Yeah. I did not know that at that time. So, perfect. And, you know, I'm, I'm just, I'm just saying, there's, wow, a, we're there's a little, back there. There's a, <laughs> there's a little bit of, of trepidation that you might have having an anesthesiologist that, that caused someone to be completely brain dead. He also made me super uncomfortable in his, in his um, way that he was dealing with patients and then not put two and two together. Well, no, you have something yeah. to there. Huh. So, yeah, there, there, there are some scary moments. And unfortunately, sometimes patients don't even know that they should be uncomfortable in a situation. So in the, in the case of our Mr. Dr. Death, his patients had no idea that they should be concerned about the surgery they're about to get. Yeah. Right? That's, I, that's, that's, that I just found it interesting, his, his marketing and salesmanship. Mm -hmm. Like the, yeah. his biggest talent was in was, marketing. Was in marketing. Yeah. And, and as a paramedic, as somebody that's going to be taking patients to somewhere and advising them to say, this is the, I'm not a doctor, but this is the treatment that I think you need. Um, being advocates for people to say, I know this, I have this knowledge of the situation and making sure that you're making a good decision to say, hey, you know what? Because of this condition, you, you might want to go to McKinsey better because of I know this knowledge. And maybe you don't say it like there's a horrible doctor, but being able to be an advocate and say, I know the situation and I know what's, what I can, my knowledge to be passed on to you to, to better this patient um, is something also I took from it. Yeah, let's, Mary, Mary Shannon's experience with Andrew's comment for a moment. Thank you, sir, Andrew. And just, and just think for a moment of, Chandlin being, and think, think of Chandlin being next to Dr. Cho to do his intubation as a student, as a paramedic student, yeah. right? And Chandlin, let's put you on the spot, what's your initial dose of amiodarone? 300 okay. milligrams. Could, right? could you imagine just for a minute that, that the patient that Chandlin is supposed to be doing the intubation on codes before he has a chance to do it? So he's in the room and witnesses Dr. Cho pulling up 2,700 milligrams and 60 milliliters of amiodarone. 2,700 milligrams. Right? I would happily tell him he was wrong. Right? I would happily <laughs> tell him he was wrong. Are you kidding me? You, I'd love to tell that guy he was wrong. <laughs> 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 that's, 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 now that you know who Dr. Cho is, and you'd be happy to tell him because he did it wrong the first time. I know, you if I were. no idea who okay. the doctor was, and no. you saw them do something incorrect, oh. thinking that they're supposed to know, would you still do the same? That's a good if question. I, if I was certain that he was giving way too much, and I, was, and I knew it, yeah. So what would you know about anesthesiology? I know that. I know, I know that he told us that. Right. But in terms of being in for a it. surgical ward, as a Doctor of okay. anesthesiology, I have no idea what they need. You, you see the problem, right? You don't know. It's I a mean, big, it's a, it's a larger, for me, it's a larger problem. 
Strategic way of asking, like that seems like a lot. So why are you doing that? <laughs> yeah, you, uh, it's a it's a fairly complex thing. In fact, um, if any of you are interested, um, Andrew gave a suggestion without even giving a suggestion. But that that is a that is a reasonable topic to consider is looking at the structure of EMS and whether or not that structure is for the benefit and advancement of the entire industry. So how, how is information disseminated? How uh, are agencies able to collect current information and to put it into practice, right? Mm -hmm. um, how often are agencies not following the most current yeah. research or information and updating their protocols as a living document rather than a protocol that hasn't been updated in you know, several years, right? Those are all, and, and how, how, what is the, how does the structure help or hinder the ability of anybody in the line to be able to call a halt, right? Let's, let's put it into a different perspective. Let's say that we are, you're doing a wilderness litter, and I know that we haven't covered wilderness medicine in this class, but if you're doing a wilderness littering situation, and we have four people on a litter carrying somebody five miles over um, semi-rugged terrain, right? It is, it is standard. It is a standard rule that anybody on that litter crew can call a halt. Anybody, no matter who the leader is, it's standard. Because if one person goes down, not only are they potentially hurt, but your litter goes down, and if one person goes down out of four, then the, the weight distribution of the litter will automatically have a high potential of harming any one of the other three litter bearers that are trying to hold it up, right? So it's standard. doesn't matter who's in charge. Anyone can call a halt, and it is obeyed immediately. But is that the case on a paramedic scene? In no. most agencies, I don't know. Maybe there's agencies that do it. Maybe there are agency, agencies that aren't. What's the standard operating procedures? What's the unwritten rules for how people will interact? And like another thing that I think about a lot is, you know, if someone was going to give uh, nine times the dose of amiodarone and kill someone instantly, like it would be relatively easy to say stop, don't do that dose. But like anyone who volunteers or works at a department, there's plenty of people that you can probably think of that are like, that's a terrible paramedic. Yeah. I hope, like, oh, I'm glad that their their station doesn't cover like where I live. Yeah. Because I wouldn't want them like treating my wife or my family or anything like that. And like everybody knows who they are, but they just continue on. And like maybe they're not doing things that are killing people, but they're just terrible and like they, yeah. Yeah, and, and what's like, the bad what's how do you Quality control that. Yeah, as I say, what's the balance between quality control and training versus if you try to do that, they leave and then you don't have anybody at all. So then the question is, is having them be a terrible paramedic but present <laughs> better, better than, than not having anybody? And maybe the answer is no, it would well, be better not have anybody. But those are, those are good questions. So back to your litter scenario, we had that exact same litter scenario this last summer, and any one of those students could have called stop, of which a student did. I am tired, and I need to have a break. And the leader said, no, we got this. We're going to keep going. Yeah. <laughs> and literally ran that litter crew into the ground. They got back to that base camp, and they were yeah. freaking fried. Yeah. And they were mentally done, they were exhausted, and they were toast. And this is just a scenario up in the trees up there. So now you have an entire litter crew of six people that don't want to do anything at that point, including patient care. Yeah. So all patient care went out the window because 
Somebody called stop. But the leader was like, no, we got this. We're going to power through. And they all listened. So, so the question then would be how do you get the information out that there needs to be an overall structural change? And how do you follow through with that structural change and put it into practice? Right? We, we went away from, in CPR, asking people, are you OK? Are you tired? Can you keep going? Do you need a rest? Mm -hmm. And moved towards you get change. It's time to change. Based on a protocol of change, right? It's just our protocol is we are going to change. Uh, and that's because asking them did no good. Because anyone you asked, I'm good, I'm good. eight times out of 10, said exactly that, right? Yeah. Yeah. I just think it's really interesting that we're coming back to this trust in a body to determine who is a quality medic versus who isn't. Yeah. Because I, like if you're the first of any kind of medic in your field, you are going to be deemed not as effective, right? Like, I mean, if you're not as strong or you're not as outspoken or you're not as loud or you don't have the right personality or you have a very dry sense of humor or whatever, like all of these things in somebody's eyes could be deemed as reasons why you're unfit for the job. And so then putting trust in this body that we saw in Dr. Death be co-opted by these other interests, I mean, I just think it's really interesting that it's this idea that you know, the, the bad guy always thinks they're the good guy, right? So yeah. you're kind of hitting a weird point of pointing fingers, but also you how, do you, how do you not? Yeah, I, and I don't have the answer. And maybe that's the, the question. How do we answer a question like that? What we do know, though, is that we've got a physician clearly doing something incorrect, and patients that are being harmed, and a lack of response even after it's known. I mean, it's one of those things like doctors say, you're gonna kill somebody eventually. It's going to happen. But it shouldn't happen that close together. Yeah. And, and that should have immediately raised all sorts of red flags. When you have two patients back to back die on the table, there should have been at least a peer review of like, what were you doing yeah. exactly? Like, what was going on? And then they could at least take that information and said, like, he was performing that surgery wrong and then taking that up higher. Or been like, okay, we see under these circumstances that what you were doing was difficult and it happened and we don't see anything at fault and then leave it at that. But there wasn't any sort of, like, there wasn't even a peer review of somebody having a high percentage of failures. Yeah. And I mean, we're talking like in his, like, that first week, it was like, almost like an 80 or 90% failure rate. I mean, you can't, yeah. and nobody noticed. So I'm, I'm a little curious, uh, just on your overall thoughts. This was the first case, and the only case that I'm aware of right now, where a physician was put on tri criminal trial for something that he did in the operating room. Wasn't it a big push by other physicians not to put him on trial? It was for fear yeah. that they could also be held. So my, my question, so, so that's my question for you. This wasn't a, this wasn't a negligence case that was gonna be solved through insurance and that kind of stuff. This was a criminal case where he's going to jail for something that he did in the operating room. So I'm just curious on your thoughts on it. I. I kind of want to call bullshit on that because on um, them doing it, on them not doing it, on this being the first criminal case for charging somebody mm -hmm. like that. Like maybe I just don't understand the the legal question at play. But there have been a number of different charges on physicians for improper e affect with patients when they're under anesthesia. Um, which I think is that 
is equal parts whether or not they were performing the procedure or not. They provided a medication which we are able to provide. I mean, as yeah, that's human beings that can provide paralytics and hypnotics. Yeah. I mean, you're what you do in those circumstances is really, really important. Yeah, let's let's be clear. This was not a um, a case of him providing a medication for the purposes of doing something to the patient inappropriately, raping no. the patient or something like that. Because um, that, that's in a whole different category. Because in that case, there he's not being charged for his procedure. He's being charged for assault, something that he did to that patient that was not part of the normal procedural process. This was a case where you had a doctor performing a, a specific procedure, not for the purposes of doing something. Harm. Yeah, not for the purpose of trying to harm them in a in a um, assault fashion. He did a procedure, completed the procedure, and moved the patient through as if they had gotten the correct procedure. He felt and and so the the difference in that is that the legal system is now, in this case, they are they are picking apart what he did in a procedure in a high-risk procedure, for that matter, and saying, you are going to jail for what you did in that procedure. Not, you're going to jail for raping somebody, or you're going to jail for having done this to steal something yeah. from them, or do this for something outside of your medical practice. It is, he was only within his medical confines, doing a medical procedure, and he did it wrong. You, you thought you were doing the right thing, but you weren't. And that's, and that's, and that's the problem. That's what is the first thing for him. He was not taking, he didn't bring in drugs that were not appropriate for the procedure. He didn't bring in something to do something different to the patient than what the patient was scheduled to do. He scheduled the patient for a procedure, did that procedure, did the procedure, with, and did the procedure incorrectly, and is now put on criminal, criminal trial for it. But the thing is, he, he, there's plenty of times when people were like, you're doing something wrong. You were, you, you obviously, like calling stop, and he yep. didn't. And he threw his weight around to say, no, I'm the right person yep. for this. And that's, that has to be, that has to have some count to say, like, hey, Corey, you're doing something wrong. Okay, I, for you, you go, okay, I'll stop. Let's talk about this, figure out what it is. And if it's legit, I'll stop. And if not, we're going to continue. But there's there's none of that thought process, and that has to be accounted for too. Sure. There were times when he went in for a certain procedure and didn't do that. He ended up like opening it up and being like, "I'm going to put a screw here. Maybe I'll put right. something here." Yeah, he went in for the right procedure. He just did it wrong. Or put things in the wrong place. It went to into the, the wrong place. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think that they actually originally were talking about doing it as a negligence case, but they thought that they had the evidence to prove that he was intentionally doing this. And, in, yeah. and they, used, they used that one email that he had written to his girlfriend saying that I could cause death and I could kill people as really kind of the, the linchpin of their case of making it a criminal case mm -hmm. rather than just a negligence case. Gotcha. So um, is there any question in anybody's minds that he did stuff wrong? <laughs> Because it could be. Do you believe that he did things wrong? And that he caused injury of some sort? The, the question is this. The, 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 I'm not making an argument, by the way. I mean, I am making an argument. I'm not trying to steer you one direction or the other. Here's the question that, that a lot of physicians were asking, why they were maybe upset that this was going into a, to be a criminal case. So, so Jenny had a brain tumor a few years ago, okay? and so did my sister for that matter. And this brain tumor that she had was tucked up right against um, a major cerebral artery. Okay? And one of the risk factors for this, this particular procedure is that as you're cutting away the tumor, and getting the tumor taken out of the brain, 
there's a reasonable risk that you could nick that artery. And if you nick that artery, there's really not a lot that you can do for it. it it's a hemorrhagic stroke right there. That's it, right? Does the knowledge that doing something in a surgical procedure and it going wrong open the door for a high risk surgery to not be done because of the possible ramifications that happen during that surgery. So what you're saying is, if you have a surgery that has a 10% chance of survival or a 10% chance of success, something that's low, but it's better than not certain death, they will opt now to not even Perhaps. take that chance. That's the, que that's the question. That is, is the question. 10% better than nothing? That's the question. Then you go, this physician is not very successful, but you don't know that. He thinks he's amazing. Well, if it's already a 10% so the, the, the question wasn't, yeah. the question from those particular physicians was not, or the argument from those particular physicians was not that he deserved to not be a surgeon anymore. And it wasn't that he didn't do something wrong or that he should somehow not be in jail. That wasn't their argument at all. The argument was, this went to a criminal court. And does that open the door for these other surgeries with surgeons that are doing the right thing but cause damage or death in their patients? Does that open the door for them to also mm -hmm. go to a criminal court? How open does this door happen? Yeah. So wouldn't that and was there a different way that he could have been <laughs> sanctioned without it going to a criminal court? Kind of so, like, go ahead. Wouldn't that kind of open like the box and saying, well, if he's going to get in trouble, because this isn't the physician's choice whether to perform the surgery or not. Yep. So wouldn't it kind of lead down the box of, okay, well, if he's going to get in trouble for killing someone in a high-risk surgery, I am not going to even try the surgery that could save someone. Well, that's some of the argument that's being made. And possibly would save someone, but now it's just, I don't want to take the risk of going to jail. That, that's, some of the, that's some of the argument that's being made. I feel you like have to look at the doctor's reputation, or not, let's take reputation, not <laughs> yes. the doctor's uh, success rate. Success rate. Well, what if it's all, like, the, like I said, 10% so success rate. this doctor death had a success rate, compared to the number of surgeries that he's actually performed, and the number of people that have come up with either death or significant injury compared to Jenny's doctor who has the potential of thousands of surgeries versus hundreds and had a success rate of 98%, but 2% 2, 2 had significant problems or death, that ratio of success versus the ratio of doctor death's success can be taken into play. Well, that's all subjectivity. I mean, yeah, and, then and there's Dr. no, Dad there's no objectivity to, to it. There's no like guaranteed ten percent every great. time. A green person right here. Yep. So uh, I guess I'm kind of wondering about also the like morbidity and mortality like conference thing that typically goes on after a patient dies. Um, like my grandfather, he died on the operating table from heart surgery and. He, his doctor was brought in for a conference and they went through everything. They legitimately broke down every step from him being sedated to him being cut open and found that, you know, everything that the doctors did was right. And we knew that. We knew he had a very low chance of surviving. But my question is, because we don't hear about that in the podcast of what were the end results of those. Because one thing in the podcast that popped up to me was, I think it was like the first or second one where it was, the person was supposed to be having like a lumbar uh, surgery and he was actually doing it for thoracic. That's a pretty big space to get wrong. Mm -hmm. And it leads back to what Andrew was saying, of like no one stopped him and everyone knew that it was a lumbar section that needed to be operated yep. on. Why are we working on the thoracics? So, like in a morbidity and mortality conference, that'd be something of like, why did you purposely go for the wrong section of the body? Which in court, you can then look at, well, this was elder abuse because you knew it was the wrong section 
of the body, yet you still went for it. It's possible. So. I feel like we can relate to it with like a needle decompression where we go second intercostal right above the third rib, midclavicular, but what if we tried to needle decompress in the fourth intercostal, uh, like, more towards the center? More towards know, the like, center. Like, what if you have like a super, I don't know, I'm thinking about it, like, what if you have like a super obese patient and you can't like feel the rib at all and you're like, well, I need to decompress you, but like, I don't know where that rib spot is. Like how, let's, let's put it back to Dr. Cho real quick before I let you go. Let's, let's say Dr. Cho, what if he went into a criminal case for what he did instead of the litigation that happened? which was $12.5 million, something like that, right? Does that then open the door? Because it, he gave the right medication, he gave it the right time. He gave an incorrect dose, right? He gave nine times the incorrect dose. But does that open the door then for a criminal court to then be able to take determine, yeah, to take any medical provider and Put them on trial for the dose of something they give, hmm. and does that change and say, "Wow, if you have this patient that 50 mics of fentanyl isn't touching, 100 mics of fentanyl isn't touching, 200 mics of fentanyl isn't touching," let's go ahead and give them another 200 mics. You're up to 400 mics of fentanyl. Finally, it's starting to touch, but now they're going to rest for distress, and now we. Yeah. But but back to the back to the possibility of litigation or criminal court, there's a cap of 75 mics of fentanyl. No more. Right? Because that's now in your protocol and it's no longer a no longer a range. It's it's that. And it doesn't touch that particular Wait, patient. What? No, he, he's making it. I'm oh. I'm, oh, I'm, I'm sure no, no. I'm just read it. I am saying <laughs> what I'm saying. <laughs> What will happen if Dr. Cho would have gone to criminal court for a dosing mistake instead of it being covered with insurance that you're keeping and that litigation, negligence that goes towards insurance, and it goes to a criminal case, how far does that go down the line of then going to paramedic protocols and saying, you're going to give two milligrams of morphine, period, right? His insane dose, you know, like permanently, they, they made that guy brain dead. Or Absolutely. Or That's different than giving somebody a little bit it, too it, much fentanyl. You're your, right. Your, in your you're, you're right in the. But it in seems the, like criminal. You're right in the in the aspect of of the practical application of giving, but from a court standpoint, what goes through precedence is that he had he would have gone into criminal court for a dosing problem. And therefore, what comes out of that, what comes out of that, potentially, when you're, when you're looking at people that are then writing protocols, they're going, okay, there was a court case that went to criminal court, not, he didn't no go practice. to criminal court, right? Not through insurance for a dosing mistake. But the dosing mistake caused a lot of problems. For Understood. So every dose in the future. But, 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 but it still yeah. meant that a dosing mistake instead of being handled in insurance, is handled in criminal court. And if it's, there's a possibility of criminal court coming into play, you play the narrowing odds of not allowing so much flexibility in dosaging based on your patient. Seems like if it was gonna to go to criminal court, they, were, they would have to prove intent rather than negligence. How would you do that? Quite possibly. <laughs> well, like like Dr. Death, death, you'd have to have interview well, the I nurses and other people. Show. Well, it doesn't matter. Either way, you got to have to build a case. To, the, the, to the big to thing there for you to understand is just that we sometimes have these knee-jerk opinions on something, and we just have to realize that it, it might be more far-reaching than than what we initially what we initially start thinking. Uh, how many of you read, uh, listened to the podcast? Can I still remember the name of it? I think I posted it. Did I not? Huh? The one that you gave me on checklists. Oh, oh yeah. Brain. Did you guys? I posted Remember a few pilots. Guys. Yeah, pilots yeah. yeah. Oh, I've heard that before. So if you didn't, you should go back and listen to it uh, because it kind of plays a role right into what we're what we've been talking about here. So. I kind of played that. I mean, this is just a conversation with Dr. Cho that the Northwest 
anesthesiology group is actually they're not employed by Riverbend. They're their own private group that are contracted Correct. by Riverbend. So looking at the settlement here, sixty percent of the verdict was on Peace Health's dime. Yes. When in actuality they just contract with the group and they But they are the ones that are responsible and the hospital is where the patient went. Yeah. I don't know, it's just who bore the amount of money is, is interesting. Yeah. It's back to dollars and basically what time. Yeah. What was the certain line that was going to work there? 